Good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to call the regular meeting of council to order. Our clerk today will be Ms. Sheila Gurry. Uh, we have uh, introduction of late items, Ms. Gurry. Yes, thank you, Your Worship. Agenda item 2A, procedural motion to proceed in camera. We need to add community charter section 90, subsection 2, subsection B. And that's it, Your Worship. Thank you very much. Procedural motion to proceed in camera. Move, Councillor. Good evening, everyone. I'd like to welcome all of you to the March 18th regular meeting of council. I'd like to first recognize that we are gathered on the traditional territory of the Sinemic First Nation. Our clerk tonight will be Ms. Sheila Gurry. Tonight's regular meeting of council will be held in accordance with the community charter, council procedure bylaw 2018, number 7272. The question period sign-up sheet is on the table by the double doors to my left for agenda items only. If during the meeting any member of the gallery has a question regarding an agenda item, please write down your name and the agenda item on the sheet. I'm not seeing anyone joining us electronically tonight, and the first item on the agenda is the introduction of late items. Ms. Gurry, please. Thank you, Worship, and good evening. For late items this evening, we have agenda item 10. We're adding consent items from the Advisory Committee on Accessibility and Inclusiveness, which was held on March 13th, 2024. We're adding a report titled Rezoning Application Number RA-475 for 444, 450, 500 Comox Road, 55 Mill Street, and 1 Terminal Avenue as Agenda Item 7C. And we're reordering the remaining agenda items accordingly. And not noted, but it will be a supplemental item, Your Worship, is under correspondence, which is item... 16 on your agenda there'll be a c and it's a request regarding the beaufort pickleball pickleball court and that's it your worship thank you very much motion for adoption of the agenda is amended moved council perino seconded council eastmere all those in favor any opposed none motion carries motion for adoption of the minutes is circulated moved council perino seconded councillor hemmons all those in favor any opposed none motion carries thank you Mayor's report tonight, um, I'm uh, very pleased to reiterate what was announced on March the 11th, uh, which is the Culture Award recipients for this year as we celebrate local excellence in the 2024 Cultural Awards. Uh, the first is Excellence in Culture 2024, Paul Gogo. I think uh, many of us are well familiar with his uh, excellence as a, mu a nationally recognized musician and artist. Uh, past recipients have included uh, Grant Lear and Nixie Barton, Susan Juby, Jackie Casey, Rick Scott, Devin Joyner, I. Lalem, Brandon Tang, and Joel Good. Uh, Mr. Gogo, uh, having had a long career, over 30 years, uh, joins a very select group. The Honor and Culture Award recipient for 2024 is Suki Sanga. Uh, that award is given to an individual group or corporation that is known for dedic its dedication and support of the development of the cultural fabric of Nanaimo. And past recipients have included Arlene Blundell, Debbie Truman, Gerda Hoffman, William Good, Dean Chadwick, Trish and Jeff Horrocks, Mary Ann Turley, Christine Whitelaw, and Bruce Halliday, and Margot Holmes. Uh, she's the founder of the Vancouver and Bangra, coming from a small com community in uh, North Delta and settled in Nanaimo in 2020, and she has worked very hard to attain this level of excellence. And finally, the Emerging Cultural Leader Award is Annalise Lamb. Uh, this award targets individuals under 30 who have contributed significantly to the cultural life of Nanaimo, and past recipients include Shade Johnson, Amanda Scott, Liz Glassford, Nico Rhodes, Patrick Alec, and Elliot Whitehill. 
Uh, she's a pas passionate and dedicated young Highland dancer. She was the first dancer from Vancouver Island to win the World Highland Dance Championship in 40 years. Uh, there has never been a dancer from the Nama win a World Highland Dance Championship until Annalise won. Uh, we are very proud of her indeed. Uh, the next uh, item I want to mention is the uh, paid parking is being inst instituted around near the Nanaimo Hospital uh, to address the parking demand. A uh, new hotspot parking app will provide convenient and accessible payment options. Uh, we're bringing in pay parking and introducing a web-based mobile hotspot parking to the street parking areas around NRGH to respond to the growing street parking challenges faced by residents and visitors uh, who are hoping to find a parking spot near the hospital. Uh, parking rates will be consistent with downtown rates at $1.25 an hour, and pay parking will be in effect Monday to Friday, uh, 8 a.m. to 5 p.m., and free on weekends and evenings. And finally, a very good news announcement, which probably hasn't made it in, into the uh, ge media generally. The Junior All-Native Tournament, known as JANTS, was named the Canada Sport Event of the Year in Group B with organizations events with budgets under less than a million dollars just on Friday, March the 15th at the Prestige Sport Tourism Awards in Winnipeg. This is a national award presented by Sport Tourism Canada. It recognizes exceptional sport tourism initiatives, multi-sport games and events, and it also shines a spotlight on the people and places behind these initiatives multi-sport games and events that make the Canadian sport tourism industry so dynamic and diverse. Uh, the Junior All-Native Tournament 2023, hosted by Sinemic First Nation and the City of Nanaimo, has emerged as a significant event in Canadian Indigenous sports landscape, leaving a lasting economic and social impact on both the host city, First Nations and communities across BC. It was hosted on March 19th to 24th uh, last year. <clears throat> And it was the largest jant ever, bringing 1,200 athletes and 91 teams from dozens of communities across BC. Uh, more than 4,000 spectators were wowed by the opening ceremonies at Frank Crane Arena, preaching a parade of banners representing the 34 nations participating. 10,000 spectators viewed close to 200 basketball games played throughout the community. And the uh, youth athlete social dance was attended by a thousand Jant athletes at the Bevan Park Social Center. I might add that approximately 140 volunteers contributed an estimated 1,440 volunteer hours to make the event a success. I would be remiss if I didn't obviously recognize the tremendous work of all the volunteers and all those involved. And I will leave it to Sinemic First Nation to, to name persons uh, from Sinemic who were involved in particular, uh, but I can safely say here on the city side that the Parks and Recreation Department, uh, led by Mr. Harding, uh, was a, a, huge, a huge contributor, but I need to give a very important and distinct credit to the now CAO of Powell River, uh, our Lisa Bhopal Singh, who with another team worked so very hard to ensure the success of that event uh, that has led to, as I announced at the start of this uh, rambling little chat of mine, a national award recognizing chant. Uh, I might say to all of those who are listening tonight, sport tourism is a major economic driver for us, and all uh, that has happened out at our, our uh, near our pool, near, near uh, NAC and the NIC, uh, and all the improvements there are providing incredible economic benefits to the community as well as in encouraging good health and sport. That is it for my report. Uh, Ms. Gurry, in terms of rise and report tonight. Um, your Worship, there's the one item from your closed meeting today, uh, which is um, March 18th, 2024, where there was the um, new appointment due to a resignation for the um, systems planning organization. So I think you can announce that. Uh, yes, happy to announce that uh, Councillor Brown, who stepped back from that job, uh, he has lots of pressing burdens in his life to manage and handle. Uh, and happy to announce that Councillor Ben Besselbrock, Ben Gesselbrock, has taken over the position, and Councillor Aaron Hemmons remains the alternate. Uh, we have no presentations. We have no committee minutes. Uh, pardon me. We have committee minutes, but they're just for receipt and no motion. Motion for adoption of the consent items, but Councillor. 
Armstrong. Yes, I'd, I would please like to remove uh, 10B2, section 19.4, sub V. Thank you very much. Councillor Hemmins. Sorry, you'll second? Yes. Yes, thank you. <laughs> uh, all right, so as I recall, Ms. Gurry, the motion is now, as it's been moved by Councillor Armstrong, that we uh, approve the consent items subject to that which has been withdrawn, which has been in turn seconded by Councillor Hemmins. Um, yes, Your Worship, and just, just for clarification, and I know um, Councillor Armstrong was trying to narrow it down, um, as a lot of these items for the council procedure bylaw were unchanged. Um, but I was hoping that um, now with further discussions with Mr. Lindsay, we could bring the whole number two back to um, a future GPC, should that be the will of council um, for discussion. And we could just quickly go through the items that hadn't changed or that council doesn't wish to discuss okay. if Councillor um, Armstrong is amenable to that. Um, if, if that's the uh, wishes, sure. Yeah. Councillor Hemmins, supportive. Any need for discussion? If not, all those in favor? Any opposed? Councillor Brown, thank you very much. Motion carries. And in terms of the uh, item that's been removed, Councillor Armstrong? Yes, I'd like to, to uh, move that those items return to a GPC for further discussion in light of the fact that three council members weren't there and uh, I did have some confusion the way something was presented and actually voted against what I normally would have. Thank you. All right, thank you. Seconded, Councillor Perino. Any discussion? Not seeing any, all those in favor? Any opposed? Councillor Brown, motion carries, thank you. And we have delegations unrelated to agenda items. Mr. Dan Hula, re City of Nanaimo decision making. Mr. Hula. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. If I'm not, please correct me. Uh, you'll have five minutes, sir. At the end of the four minutes, I will let you know you have a minute left. Okay. Um, please, if you could introduce yourself for the record. All right. Good evening. My name is Dan Hula. This presentation is to get clarification on the connection between the decision-making of our council and the World Economic Forum, particularly in the forms of the Global Covenants of Mayors and the Economic Donut Model. I'll start off with a brief background in just a short video, and then I'll follow up with my comments. And at the end, I would welcome any comments or questions you have. All right, all right. <clears throat> What's that old phrase with the Nixon use it? Let me be perfectly clear. The World Economic Forum has no relationship with the city of Nanaimo. So here we are on the city of Nanaimo website under green initiatives. When you scroll down to the donut economic model, uh, you can scroll down further and the World Economic Forum is referenced. And when you click on it, it goes to the donut economic model that I think we've adopted in Nanaimo. This is a document uh, apparently of Mayor Krog signing on to the Global Covenants of Mayors. And here we are on the World Economic Forum website again. And when you type in Global Covenant of Mayors, they appear to be working with the World Economic Forum. What we are very proud of now is the young generation like uh, Prime Minister Trudeau, um, President of, Brazil, of uh, Argentina and so on, is that we penetrate the cabinets. All right, so that's the background. So from my understanding, the city of Nanaimo, for the city of Nanaimo to act in compliance with the global covenant of mayors that would result in the cost of our proposed operational center uh, having some certain results. So the green guidelines might apparently drastically increase the cost, which of course could only be paid for by increased taxes. And in addition, it's my understanding that perhaps Mr. Bill Sims at the December 4th meeting mentioned this project might include a data collection aspect so my question regarding that would be, who is collecting the data, what gets collected, and more importantly, who is it shared with? 
So, in my opinion, without complete transparency, this appears to be bordering on some kind of Orwellian Big Brother secret surveillance if there's no full transparency to accompany it. Second point, the emergency declaration power under the direction of the World Health Organization, which is directly connected to the World Economic Forum, is another concern. This power in the form can take the form of selective lockdowns, social distancing, mandated vaccines, and this was already abused during COVID-19. And I say abused because studies from around the world, including from pharmaceutical companies themselves, clearly show that the restrictions were not based on evidence. My time is flipping by quicker than you would think. Therefore, foreign control of our local uh, health and movement through emergency declarations is not desirable. I ask for clarification on whether this type of emergency declaration can be implemented with just the signature of mayor and CAO, in this case, Mr. Krog and Mr. Lindsay. Third, critical mass of people around the world are learning of blunders and abuses by governments at all levels. Since the average citizen cannot afford to physically go to protest, they have to rightfully confront this at a local level. Therefore, politicians, administrators, and all city staff who choose to be a part of a global One agenda minute, Mr. Hula. may be held accountable. Reactions that have already been taken in other countries and communities range from public humiliation to civil suits, and it would be very discouraging and disappointing to have Nanaimo come to this point. Therefore, let the record show that the council and staff have been informed of this foreign globalist threat to our city, the people of Nanaimo, and our democracy in general. In my opinion, no citizen of Nanaimo wants to be controlled by a one-world government of unelected billionaires. Honest people strive to find the truth, not to, shut, not to smother it. Since our decisions and votes are recorded publicly, please consider my points as we move forward together as a community. Um, by the way, Council can unshackle itself from the United Nations directions and options by voting to rescind the motion for being part of the Partners in, for Climate Protection. If you thank could you. wrap it up, thank you. Thank you, thank you please. As, as, I have, as I, I have said many times, this is not a place for showing approval or disapproval of what is spoken here. Uh, Sorry, was there any questions or comments? Thank you. Uh, well, actually, in a rule-oriented society with laws, I can, sir, but, but thank you for your comment. Um, are there any questions from members of council? Mr. You all have Hula. a good understanding of what you're signed up for with uh, the United Nations and, and, and Mr. stuff? And Mr. Hulai, I appreciate it, and, and I, I want to respond to you. I'm, I'm going to take your comments because some people take this very seriously, obviously, and I think it's important that you receive a serious response. Uh, the Global Covenant of Mayors, referred to, is an alliance of cities and local governments with a shared long-term vision promoting voluntary action to combat climate change and move to a low-emission, climate-resilient future. The Global Covenant of Mayors Canada is a collaboration between the Federation of Canadian Municipalities, which is the a member organization of municipal politicians and municipalities across this country, uh, in 2019, the city of Nanaimo was selected to participate uh, in the uh, climate leadership program as one of 25 showcase cities as a training opportunity for 20 to 40 Canadian municipalities. Through this program, the city committed to and received support in setting and monitoring climate emissions and setting adaptation goals between September 2019 and December 2020. Uh, that in involves committing to agree to advance climate action in three key areas, reducing greenhouse gas emissions, identifying adapting to the risk associated with the climate change and increasing access to clean and affordable energy, uh, and uh, commitment uh, to meet those, and, and rewarding local governments to meet these commitments with a variety of globally recognized badges. Uh, the City of Nanaimo was awarded a compliance badge in 2022, which was given to cities that have accomplished steps under the three pillars, mitigation, adaptation, access to energy. The city previously earned the adaptation badge for 2021. A number of municipalities uh, received honorariums to attend a meeting in Montreal on January 8th to 10th, 2020. 
That included the city of Courtney, uh, district of Yakulet, city of Moncton, city of Fredericton, town of New Glasgow, city of Burlington, etc. I could go on. The city of Nanaimo received the grand sum of $800, which was used uh, to send Rob Lawrence, the late Rob Lawrence, who was a well-regarded public servant working for the city of Nanaimo, to the conference. Um, the Global Covenant of Mayors Canada and Showcase Cities pilot project was presented to this council at an open meeting on December 2nd, 2019. Uh, so we're talking about the previous council, which included not all of us, but most of us. Uh, the recommendation was that council support participation in the Global Covenant of Mayors Canada Showcase Cities pilot project and endorse the mayor's letter of commitment, which was done unanimously. I signed that letter. I hesitate to tell you that notwithstanding what the website may say, I do not have communication with the World Economic Forum. Uh, until staff were able to drag up the letter, I haven't, hadn't seen the letter since it was signed back in December of 2019. I appreciate that people wish to believe that there is some secret, let me finish please, some secret cabal of folks who are controlling the Nanaimo City Council the basic understanding of the law would tell you, and forgive me if I sound patronizing when I say it, municipal governments have no legal standing or authority to commit their government or citizens to what amount to international treaties, and this is not an international treaty. Only the government of Canada can do that. So with respect, from a legal perspective, what you are alleging has no basis uh, council, to my knowledge, has no influence with or attendance at or receives funds from or direction from or communication with the World Economic Forum. And I appreciate that some people wish to continue to believe that. But you know what? Uh, I have fairly, how shall I say, basic Christian values. But the Pope isn't writing to me and no, neither is the Archbishop of the Anglican Church of Canada but I happen to share some beliefs in Christianity that many citizens do. I happen to share beliefs in democracy, but Donald Trump and Joe Biden aren't communicating with me either. So with great respect, I appreciate your comments today, uh, but please, for heaven's sakes, let's get on with governing this city in an intelligent way and stop suggesting that somehow this council is controlled by some body outside of the electorate of Nanaimo who get the choice in a wonderful functioning democracy, critical of it as you may be, that gets to elect us every four years. Councillor Armstrong, I see you wish to speak. Just have a question. You mentioned, you mentioned something about the data centre. Could you just expand on that? Because. Uh, we well, don't have a data center involved in this. Coincidentally, all the communities, communities that have participated in the Global Covenant of Mayors, they all get the same information, usually through the CAOs. And the concern across Canada and many other countries is everything is done so perfectly and in step. It's not a coincidence that they all manage to come up with the same ideas at the same time. So you can pretend that it's really independent and everything else. But if you look at the bigger picture, and the records can show this, you can see all the different communities are having all the same plans at the same time with the same wording. And it doesn't come directly from the top World Economic Forum itself. That would be too obvious. They do it through different organizations who have their sub-organizations. But if you go on the website, you can trace them back Just fairly easily if you put in the effort. Data centers around all over, it's the hot, the hot, hot thing now is to have data centers, not just here, but if we have a data center and then on East Wellington uh, regional data center, which some local people have looked into to see that it is funded by a company in Toronto, which is a shell company for one in Hong Kong, which is under, eventually traces back to the Chinese Communist I just, Party. I just, my question so, is though, you said, are we having a data center at the Nanaimo Operational Center? Is, is there any part, or are any of you aware of anything with the plans for the operational center that have anything to do with data collection? The only thing that I can say, and I'm sure Mr. Sims will correct me if I'm wrong, is that we do have counters for cars going through at certain lights or to show, I'll ask Mr. Sims if that's okay, Your Worship. 
Your Worship, we do collect data. It's c collecting data on the consumption of water, the, the production of water at our water treatment plants, the number of cars that pass through an intersection, the number of times a traffic light cycles, the sewage flow, the flows in the streams and storm drainage, that, that kind of thing. Road temperatures, it's called SCADA, a supervisory control and, and data acquisition system. It sits on a computer, a server, which we back up to another server, so there's two or three. I suppose that's data collection, but it's not a data collection center by any stretch. Is, Thank you. And is there any facial recognition or sound that can get picked no. up by any of this? I, I'm, just so I'm you know, sorry. in Canada, we just, can't just, do just, that. Mr. Armstrong, just a minute. Look, I'm asking. There is a speaker at the front. No one can hear. Shh, be quiet, please. No one can hear him because there's voices in the background who won't observe the common courtesy of letting the speaker have his turn. Thank you. Sir, Mr. Hula, please cede, please. Is there any form in the plans or currently that have facial recognition as part of the data collection or the potential of that? I will answer that for you. Under the Canada Privacy, we cannot do that. Oh, I know what the regulations are. I'm asking what the regulations Well, we're not going to break regulations, sorry. <laughs> not going to happen. Not on something like that. Thank you. Thank uh, you. I'm, I'm not even going to ask so, Mr. Sims to dignify that comment with a response. You look at uh, with, 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 with great, with great, with great respect, I have tried to be reasonable. I've tried to be reasonable as I've listened to the most wild, ridiculous allegations, but that one takes it all. I'm sorry. Uh, Councillor Brown, do you have something you wish to say? Yeah, and I think it would probably be conducive if we just you know, followed up uh, offline. So my email is tyler.brown at sure. Um <clears throat> But I, I just a genuine question that I'm curious and I really am genuinely curious because this sort of uh, question does emerge, um, you know, emails today about it. And I would really like to know what evidence would look like that would give folks the assurance or the confidence uh, that there is no third party organization expressing influence over council. So like I said, I think that's probably a bigger conversation we need to unpack. Sure. So, Tyler.brown at Nanaimo.ca, just like the color, and I would happily follow up with you on that. Thanks. Okay. If you want to know the bigger picture, you just go on the World Economic Forum YouTube, look up Noah Harari, and uh, see what he has to say for the future and what the plans are. There's a really easy way, like if you want something really simple, uh, Noah Harari. No, sorry, I'm asking what evidence you yep. would need to have the assurance or confidence to know that your local council, these folks here, aren't under the influence. So, you know, what's the bar of evidence that you need? Again, big, bigger question, let's follow up online and I'll happily unpack that with you and try to get you that. Okay, what you that's, need. thank you. That's, you know, a bigger a question I'd have to think about a little bit before answering in a, form, a forum like this. Absolutely. But Definitely, that would be great. Okay, so just some food for thought. Please uh, check into it if you're interested. Um, that would be great. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. H Councillor Perino. You wish to say something? Your Worship, uh, Your Worship, I just want to say uh, there are two of us at the table right now that we were only elected in November of 2022. And I can tell you not once have I heard from any member of the prior council or the mayor not once, the World Economic Forum. Not once. I have to tell you, like I'm, I'm the newbie. I wasn't here in 2019. I didn't vote for the donut uh, economy. I didn't. I wasn't a part of any of that. I have not heard from a single councillor or the mayor. Not once. So I don't know if that's any assurance for you, but I can tell you, it's, it's certainly not what we spend our time discussing. We're so busy with the issues of this city. You'll have to come to the mic. We can't hear you, but I, I'm just trying to give you some assurance. I just don't. I just don't hear any of it. Yeah, I don't think that you're sitting there with little electrodes no. being plugged into the World Economic Forum because it's much more subtle and nuanced than that. It would be done through certain organizations, and what what happens is it usually the problem, real problem, is now a lot of it is bypassing councils and communities and going straight to bureaucracies that are associated. So we're like maybe not in this case, for example, but other ones where CAOs would go and get training on how to implement things. And Doesn't the terms, they would go out of their way to not use terms like World Economic Forum. It would be 
the associations of the associations that go with it. And again, I'll look into it, provide it yeah. to Mr. Brown, and yeah. if he wants to share that with you oh, guys, he, he will. can too. Yeah, he will, because I, we spend a lot of time with staff, never hear things. Oh, well, you know, I know, everybody's busy and has a busy life, yes. and it's hard to take the time to look into things like this. But when you see larger patterns and you see what's happening in other communities, and you see the concept of democracy seeming to start get smaller and smaller, like the, if, again, if you look at the plans of the World Economic Forum, I've looked at uh, Klaus Schwab's plan where it starts from, and when you see how it filters down, it's quite surprising. Thank you. Okay, yes, I will get back to you on that, Mr. Brown. Thank you very much. Uh, the next item is reports, development variance permit application number DVP 462 unit 102 and 104, 2517 Bone Road. Mr. Holm, good evening, welcome. Uh, thank you, uh, good evening, Your Worship and Council. Uh, this is a development variance permit uh, to increase the maximum permitted uh, gross floor area uh, for a um, single format retail uh, use from 750 square meters to uh, 2,458 square meters. And to, that's to allow a large format uh, retail store um, at the uh, address um, noted above, um, uh, 2517 Bowen Road, property outlined in red. Um, the uh, uh, the uh, development was actually originally um, uh, constructed to support a single uh, tenant, a large grocery store, the co-op grocery store at the time. Uh, was previously, or most recently, I guess, the, um, the site of a uh, furniture uh, retail store as well. And uh, what's proposed is consolidation of uh, two existing units uh, to create a, a larger format um, uh, single uh, tenant retail store. Uh, the gross floor area limit in the corridor zone, which uh, this property is zoned uh, core three community corridor. Uh, the, the gross floor area limitation on retail was intended to support um, uh, pedestrian scale retail um, outlets in, as uh, corridors developed out. Uh, in this case, the existing format is um, a shopping center, uh, large format um, retailer. Uh, of course, uh, notices of the proposed variance have been uh, provided to, uh, to uh, residents in the surrounding area. Uh, staff recommend uh, supporting the proposed variance. I'm happy to take any questions, thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, is there anyone present who wishes to speak to development variance permit application number DVP 462-unit 102 and 104-2517 Bowen Road? If not, I understand that we have uh, Shirley Duong, AIBC, and Brian Kapuscinski, architect, AIBC, and Andreas uh, Winecki, uh, the owner, here available to answer any questions. You're coming in via Zoom, as I understand it. I'm not seeing any- That's correct, uh, Brian here. I'm available, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, not seeing any questions, would someone care to make the recommended motion? Moved, Councillor Hemmons, seconded, Councillor Armstrong. Any discussion? Not hearing any, all those in favor and any opposed, none, motion carries. Thank you very much for your attendance tonight. Thank you, Mr. Holm. Uh, the next item is the short-term rental review. Um, our daughter and son-in-law, to my knowledge, operate uh, an Airbnb out of their basement suite, so I'm going to recuse myself. From and Your Worship, I also must recuse myself. Thank you. Councillor Armstrong, you're in charge. Oh. <laughs> right, Mr. Holmes to introduce this short-term rental review, please. Great. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, so the, um, this was an item that was actually on the uh, March 11th uh, GPC, uh, was carried over from that meeting. Uh, we're happy to uh, um, get it in front of, uh, of council. This is something that um, uh, we uh, staff have been working on uh, for a little bit of time now. Um, a present, what we're gonna do is present an, a review of the city's uh, short-term rental regulations. Um, what these, uh, this, the short-term rental um, regulations came into effect April 1st, uh, 2022. Um, so we're close to two years that uh, we've had uh, short-term rental regulations in place. 
Uh, there's been a review led by um, community planning and um, uh, Ms. Uh, Began, Kasha Began, a planner will be presenting on this, but uh, the review is also supported uh, by other um, areas, including uh, bylaw services and uh, the permit center and business licensing uh, representatives that are involved in um, licensing and enforcement related to short-term rentals. Um, so I'll turn it over to uh, to uh, Ms. Began to uh, present um, what uh, we found in the review of the two years, almost, that the city's short-term rental regulations have been in place. And also uh, this touches on the, the changes, the impact of the uh, recent provincial regulations and federal changes related to uh, short-term uh, rentals as well. So. Thank you, Ms. Began. Thank you, Mr. Holmes. Good evening, everybody. So today I'll be providing an overview of uh, the short-term rental program, uh, how the program is working, areas of concern, provincial and federal short-term rental regulations that have been uh, enacted recently, and proposed regulatory amendments. So the short-term rental program was adopted on February 7th of 2022, and I'm just gonna provide you a quick overview of uh, the main components of it. First is the requirement for a business license. It needs to be within your primary residence. It can be within a res residential, commercial, or mixed use zones. It can be within your primary dwelling unit, a secondary suite, or a detached suite. It has to be less than 30 consecutive days. There's a maximum number of guests and rooms. And you're required to provide one off-street parking stall. And the regulations are intended to restrict short-term rental uses of residential housing to maximize the supply of residential units available for long-term rental. So since the uh, regulations were enacted, we have our housing needs report that was released in 2023. So I'll provide a quick overview. So based on that report, rental housing continues to be in high demand. Although the number of secured purpose-built rental units increased uh, between 2016 to 2021, the rental population increased at a more rapid rate. Only 40% of renters were housed in purpose-built rental whereas 60% were housed in what can be called the secondary rental market. This includes housing such as secondary suites, detached suites, rental single dwelling units, condos, et cetera. And we also have a vacancy rate of 2.6% in 2023. So now moving over to the stats of how the program is working. Uh, there currently are 291 business licenses issued as of March 1st of this year. Of those, 60% were within the primary residence, so that includes a single residential dwelling or a multi-residential dwelling. 35% were, th were within a secondary suite, and 5% were within a de detached suite. However, access accessing data on how many short-term rentals are operating in Nanaimo is challenging, due to platforms such as Airbnb and VRBO's unwillingness to share their data. Using one source, AirDNA, a short-term rental marketing website, on March 1st of 2024, there were approximately 980 active listings. As the data from AirDNA is based solely on Airbnb and VRBO's listings, the data represents the lowest number of possible listings operating at any given time in Nanaimo. Other platforms, private property management websites, high season listings or other social media advertising are not included in this number. If we compare the potential number of short-term rentals operating in Nanaimo with the number of business licenses that were taken out, we're looking at a potential compliance rate of approximately 30%. Now moving on to complaints, violation, and enforcement data. We received 62 short-term rental complaints. 67 of those were for unlicensed short-term rentals. 2% were for too many guests, and less than 1% was for parking and noise concerns. What impact is it having on our hotels and motel occupancy rate? Based on data that we received from the Nanaimo Hospitality Association, the average occupancy rate for hotels and motels remained below 70% since the adoption of this program. Between 2022 and 2023, the occupancy rate increased by 2.7%. The provincial government has also released new legislation governing short-term rentals across the province. This is known as Bill 35. 
and overall the purpose of it is to turn more short-term rentals into long-term uh, housing for uh, people. And it's being done through three key responses. The first is strengthening local government tools to enforce short-term rentals. Second is returning short-term rental units to the long-term market, or sorry, rental market. And then third is establishing provincial oversight of short-term rentals. This is gonna be a phased approach. Uh, first will be, uh, which I'll go through, but it's effective from last year all the way to early uh, 2025. So first we'll be seeing, well, as of effective of October 26th of 2023, uh, the province increased fines and tickets. So they increased it from $1,000, $3,000. However, that increases for um, uh, municipal ticketing system that the city does not currently use. We use the local government bylaw notice enforcement act at this time. And the maximum fine set for that is currently at $250 per infraction per day but could be at 500, which is the maximum. Next, effective uh, May 1st of this year, the debt province will be now defining what short-term rentals are. So they'll be defining them as less than 90 consecutive days. They'll be requiring them within principal residency and they're permitting it in either a, sh a secondary suite um, or a detached suite as well as a primary resident, a private residence. Uh, they will be requiring that a business license be displayed which means the host must display the valid city and Nanaimo business license on their listing. And lastly, uh, any legal non-conforming uses uh, will end as of May 1st. Third, in the spring of 2024, uh, Provincial Compliance and Enforcement Division will be uh, uh, come into effect. This includes new Provincial Compliance and Enforcement Unit that will track compliance, issue orders, and administer penalties for violations. Effective summer of 2024, There'll be data sharing. So the new provincial data sharing system requiring platforms to submit short-term rental data to the province. Data will be shared with the local governments. Effective late 2024 and early 2025, provincial registry. So the hosts, are, hosts and platforms must register with the province and hosts must display provincial registry numbers on their listings and platforms violating against this registry um, we'll have uh, compliance and enforcement. And last would be ca platform accountability. So hosting platforms will be accountable for removing listings and, and that are not compliant with the provincial and municipal regulations. So this is the suite of uh, regulations the province is bringing into effect. Next, staff uh, undertook a jurisdictional review of other jurisdictions to see since we adopted our program and we did a jurisdictional review, um, what's changed. So staff reviewed seven uh, BC municipalities and generally Nanaimo's uh, restrictions align with those from other jurisdictions when it comes to business licensing requirements, principal residency, room and guest maximums, par and parking requirements. However, there are two notable differences the review found. First are restrictions municipalities are placing on what housing types short-term rentals are permitted. Generally, there are four categories of short-term rentals are permitted. Single residential dwelling in brown, multi-residential dwelling, secondary suites, and detached suites. If you look at Tofino, uh, they allow short-term rentals within uh, single residential dwellings, secondary suites, and detached suites, but they prohibit them within multi-residential dwellings. Whereas Burnaby and Victoria prohibit them within secondary suites and detached suites. And as of January of this year, Kelowna's council has opted to prohibit all short-term rentals in all zones, only existing short-term rentals with a valid business license that meet the provincial principal residency requirements will be grandfathered in. The other notable difference is uh, for municipalities that use the same uh, ticketing system that we do, they've set their maximum fines at $500, where as I mentioned before, ours is currently at $250 per infraction per day. All right, so the proposed regulatory amendments. So in light of the new provincial rules, staff have received the city's, staff have reviewed the city's short-term rental program to determine whether any updates may be warranted. As outlined above, staff have concerns about the potential impacts of the short-term rental program. However, until such time as accurate data is available to understand the scope of the short-term rentals in Nanaimo, 
and staff have the tools and resources to achieve compliance, staff recommend the following. One, to make minor bylaw amendments to the business license bylaw, the bylaw known as enforcement bylaw, and the zoning bylaw to one, increase short-term rental fines to $500, as well as improve compliance and enforcement. And two, monitor impacts of the new provincial regulatory rollout. In terms of future considerations, uh, staff recommends seeking compliance of short-term rentals currently operating without a business license, uh, further restricting the types of housing units short-term rentals are permitted, um, staff have been successful in bringing a number of unlicensed short-term rentals into compliance, however a proactive approach will require additional staffing resources, access to accurate data and tools. Once the effective provincial enforcement program is fully realized, a future consideration may be to explore these two options. Uh, so the province has provided some information about the rollout of this program. Um, however, given the uh, uh, questions that have arisen at the front counter and, and just uh, uh, through webinars that the uh, staff have attended, uh, staff recommended communication strategy. Uh, one includes some print tools, which includes a handout that could be given at the front counter regarding the changes, and as well as two, updating our operating guide to reflect the new provincial requirements. In terms of digital tools, uh, we've already updated our website to include information on the provincial requirements and how this impacts um, uh, in relation to our requirements, uh, recommending an e-notification, as well as a press release and social media to inform the public of these changes. And so in front of you is the proposed regulatory amendment for consideration this evening. Thank you. Any questions, Council? <laughs> Councillor Gesselbrook? Uh, thanks, uh, Chair, through you. Um, just as staff, so basically uh, the province is going to provide some resources and supports to, to get more accurate data on the short-term rentals and also um, to be able to monitor. Uh, so we basically, before we can really do anything, we've got to wait till that comes into play. Is that what I'm gathering is the... the yeah, through the chair to Councillor Gesselbrock, that is correct. There's uh, quite a suite of uh, tools that will be made available. Um, when staff came to council when the program was first implemented, these were the kind of tools that we were hoping to get from the province. Um, and they've actually come forward with it and provided them to municipalities. So um, now it's a matter of just having them implement them. They're being rolled out. And so we're just waiting for them to be rolled out to see what effect they're going to have. Great, thank you. Councillor Hammonds. Thank you, Chair. Uh, through you to staff. Under the section complaints, violations, and enforcement, um, it's noted that we had 62 complaints since the implementation of the program. Two tickets were issued to one provider. Um, were those other, uh, did we not follow through with ticketing because we were able to pull those other STRs into compliance? And further, um, was it just a matter of those STR operators not being aware of the regulations and the program that the City of Nanaimo had put in place? Mr. LaBerge? No, no uh, I'm gonna ask Ms. Davidson to come Ms. up Ms. Davidson? Um, but just through the chair to Councilor Hemmings while she's coming up here. Um, uh, yes, many did come into compliance. Ticketing was not necessary for most, and actually that's the case for a lot of municipalities that we spoke to, is uh, um, once they're aware of the regulations, they do, um, come into compliance. It's very rare that uh, ticketing is needed, especially per infraction per day. Ms. Davidson? You're on. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, can you repeat the question? I actually think it was just answered. Oh, there you, you go. It was answered. Thank you. <laughs> Anything further? Ms. Beacon answered it. It was already answered. Thank you. Anything further? Yeah, so, so I do have a couple questions. Um, you talked about the fact that we're going to have to do more enforcement, which is going to require more staff. And we already know that we're already facing significant budget. Um, is the province going to give us any dollars for that, since it's their policy, or are we going to just another download? Uh, so, uh, through the chair, to yourself, <laughs> the chair. Uh, we will be responsible, the city of Nanaimo will be responsible for enforcing our regulations and the province will be responsible for enforcing their regulations. It is not clear 
uh, at this time because the enforcement division has not been um, formed yet, exactly what that relationship will be, what resources will be available um, when those questions are posed to provincial staff. Um, they're not aware exactly how that will function, but they have made it clear that it is our responsibility to regulate our regulations. And to do that would still require additional staffing and resources. And as a follow-up, is there anything we can do to monitor to see how many of these uh, short-term rentals do end up back in the full-time rental pool? Because I've been following this in the States and it's nowhere near the numbers that were anticipated and it's actually hurt tourism. Yes, so through the chair, uh, to the chair, apologies. Oh, it's uh, okay. The jurisdictions that we did speak to that have used compliance software have paid significant costs to use it and actually have not found it to be very accurate. That what they found to be the most accurate having is their, their own staff spending every day searching all the different platforms, ensuring there is compliance. The, the, the model out there is quite large, it's quite complex. Well, no, my question is, will, it, will we be able to track how many go back into long-term rental, not short-term rental? That would require having to request information, which I don't believe is something that... So, so we have no way of knowing if this, this regulation is going to be successful, as the intention is, is to put the short-term rentals back into the major rental pool, but we can't track that. Is that correct? From a municipal perspective, unless Jeremy has something else he'd like to add, I'm not sure the province plans to track it somehow, but... Okay, thank you. Um, seeing no further people to the mic, uh, anybody care to move the recommended motion? Moved by Councillor Hammond, seconded by Council Eastmere. Call the question, all in favor? Seeing none opposed, motion carries. And I'll return the chair to the mayor. Thank you very much, Councillor Armstrong. On to item C, rezoning application number RA475-444-450-500 Comox Road, 55 Mill Street, and One Terminal Avenue. Mr. I'm recusing myself, thank you. Oh, yes, of course. It's conflicts night at council. Mr. Holm, please. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. Uh, I won't go into too much detail. This is a, uh, a property and an application that uh, council's familiar with. Um, highlighted uh, the properties in question are highlighted in red um, on the screen. Uh, this is a uh, land use contract uh, amendment, um, or sorry, land use contract discharge uh, bylaw and uh, a zoning amendment bylaw uh, that's been uh, before council for consideration uh, multiple times. Uh, last considered by council um, December 4th, 2023. Uh, sorry, 2023, um, at which time uh, council deferred uh, consideration of adoption um, of the bylaw until such time as the province had confirmed uh, that their uh, facilitated process uh, had been concluded. Um, at this point in time, uh, the city has not received uh, official communication from the province to that effect. Uh, what we have received, uh, what the city has received is a request from the um, landowner um, that uh, the bylaws be returned to council for consideration of adoption. Uh, the landowner has indicated that uh, they've withdrawn from the facilitated process. Um, I should note that uh, um, the, uh, the recommendation here, um, uh, well actually before I touch on that, uh, following uh, the last public hearing, uh, which was May 18th, uh, Sinemic First Nation provided uh, staff with a submission with respect to the specifics of the bylaws, um, so a submission related to uh, the bylaws um, in question, and uh, as, um, as such, uh, staff are recommending that uh, the bylaws, third reading of the bylaws, uh, be rescinded, um, and uh, if that were to happen, um, the, um, the bylaws would be scheduled uh, to proceed to public hearing. Uh, which the next uh, available public hearing date would be April 18th. Um, the, the proposal um, is touched on in the staff report, but the uh, rezoning is to facil facilitate a mixed use uh, development and subdivision uh, of the property um, outlined overhead. I'm happy to uh, take any questions, thanks. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Holm. I'm not seeing any questions. Moved Councillor Hemmons, the first motion, seconded by Councillor Armstrong. We will take the motion separately. Any discussion? 
Seeing none, all those in favor? Any opposed? None. Motion carries. Councillor Hemmons moves the second motion, seconded Councillor Armstrong. Again, any discussion? Not seeing any, all those in favor? Any opposed? None. Motion carries. Thank you. Uh, and we're on to item D. We'll wait for Councillor Eastway to return. Thank you. Uh, the Housing Legacy Reserve Fund Review. Ms. Mercer. Thank you, Your Worship. And Ms. Fuller. And Ms. Brinkman. Uh, the Housing Legacy Reserve Fund is a statutory reserve that fund that was created in 2005 to support affordable housing initiatives in Nanaimo. So currently the Housing Legacy Reserve bylaw is not um, completely descriptive on the details of what the fund can be used for. So staff are recommending amending the current bylaw to clarify the purpose for which the funds can be used. And this change reflects how the um, funds have been historically used. As well, staff are recommending that uh, um, the 2011 policy um, for funding allocation criteria for the Housing Legacy Reserve be rescinded as this information will be now reflected in the bylaw. So um, staff are here to answer any questions that you might have. Uh, thank you very much. Not seeing any questions. Everyone's had a chance to read the material. Councillor Armstrong, I think, do, do we need, it needs to be read out. Sorry. So, sorry. Motion that Housing Legacy Reserve Fund established in bylaw amendment bylaw 2024 number 7299-01 to clarify the purpose for which the fund was established past first reading. Seconded, Councillor Perino. All those in favor? Any opposed? None. Motion carries. Councillor Armstrong. Motion that Housing Legacy Reserve Fund established in bylaw amendment bylaw 2024 number 7299-01 past second reading. Seconded, Councillor Hemmons. Any discussion? Not seeing any. All those in favor? Any opposed? None. Motion carries. Motion that Housing Legacy Reserve Fund established in bylaw amendment bylaw 2024 number 7299-01 past third reading. Seconded, Councillor Hemmons. All those in favor? Any opposed? None. Motion carries. Motion that Council rescind the January 2011 policy COU-187 Housing Legacy Reserve Funding allocation criteria. Second to Councillor Perino. All those in favor? Any opposed? None. Motion carries. We're on to the uh, item E, the online accommodation platform reserve fund. Ms. Mercer again, please. Thank you. So the city uh, receives the 3% municipal and regional district tax or the hotel tax that is applied to the sale of short-term accommodation. So a portion of that tax is collected through the online application platform and starting in 2018, um, it's also known as OAP, um, these revenues were permitted to be used to help address housing needs um, and the OAP funds were allocated to the housing legacy reserve. Um, as there are strict reporting rules around how the OAP revenues can be used, um, staff are recommending that these funds be allocated to their own statutory reserve fund. So the balance at December uh, 31st of 2023 of 851489 would be transferred to the new online uh, accommodation platform reserve fund. And going forward, all revenues and interest relating to the OAP funds will be accumulated in that statutory reserve fund. Thank you very much. Any questions? Councillor Armstrong, please. Motion that online accommodation platform reserve fund bylaw 2024 number 7374 to establish an online accommodation platform reserve fund pass first reading. Second, Councillor Hemmons. All those in favor? Any opposed? Seeing none, motion carries. Motion that online accommodation platform reserve fund bylaw 2024 number 7374 pass second reading. Second to Councillor Hemmons. Any discussion? Not seeing any. All those in favor? Any opposed? None. Motion carries. Motion that online accommodation platform reserve fund bylaw 2024 number 7374 pass third reading. Seconded Councillor Perino. All those in favor? Any opposed? None. Motion carries. Uh, we're on to bylaws. We have none tonight, Ms. Gurry. No notices of motion. No other business per se. And we have three pieces of correspondence to deal with. Uh, the first is correspondence dated uh, 2024, March 5, from the Nanaimo Brain Injury Society, read the National Strategy on Brain Injuries Act. Uh, 
There is a motion. Um, Councillor Gesselbrock. Yeah, from from the correspondence, basically the correspondence asked if we uh, endorsed uh, to endorse B Bill C two seventy seven, which is the National Strategy on Brain Injuries Act, and that was brought forward as a private member's bill. But basically, it's a a bill um, that's asking for a, a national strategy to deal with brain injuries, and it's something that we struggle with in, in our community, and a large number of Canadians do, and we're impacted by it on the streets, and it's something that larger organization around is needed for more supports with folks with brain injuries. Um, but normally, you know, we don't wade into federal things, but this is one thing that we can, you know, simply send a letter and, and ask uh, for support, um, our support of it, uh, to let our MPs and Prime Minister know that Nanaimo could use help with this. Uh, so I would like to, to move a motion, if, if that's all right, about the request. And the, the motion basically says that Council endorse the content of the Federal Private Members Bill C-277, National Strategy on Brain Injuries Act, that Council request the Mayor to write the Prime Minister, Minister of Health and local MP, noting Nanaimo's support for Bill C-277, and the Mayor write other neighboring BC municipalities to encourage them to endorse B Bill C-27. Um, Councillor. Um, sorry about Gesselbrock. that, and so, sorry, Your Worship, through you to Council Gesselbrock, that last request that was in their letter, um, yeah. we I hadn't noted it on the annotated, and I was going to speak to it before you, you moved that part, noting that they um, the, the society should and could email um, and send their letter to each municipality themselves and ask for them to do the same thing rather than put that onus on Roger on our that, staff. Yeah. So no, that, that's fair enough. Uh, yeah. So basically, I'll just stop it at uh, that the council request the mayor to write Prime Minister and Minister of Health, local MP, noting that I'm a support for Bill uh, C-277. Uh, seconded, Councillor Hemmons. Discussion on this? Councillor Brown. Uh, thank you, Worship. Uh, as much as I may want to support it, I can't with the reference to the bill, simply because of the fact I haven't read the bill. Um, so I'm... I would be more comfortable if that reference was removed and we just spoke in general to a national strategy on Brain Injuries Act. It's not that I think there might be anything <clears throat> in particular that I disagree with in the bill, but there may be. And as a matter of principle, I, I can't uh, uh, vote, um, vote with my conscience uh, on support or opposition for a bill if I'm not actually aware of the content. Uh, thank you very much, Councillor Armstrong. Yeah, I, I agree with Councillor Brown. I really struggle with us stepping into federal jurisdiction, um, especially for a new bill. It's different if there's already an established bill, which we've seen the impact. So I can't support the motion as is written either. Thank you. Councillor Gesselbrock? If folks want to suggest an amendment, let's uh, do that. I do know that the bill C-277 is attached to the uh, a report, and it's a couple pages, so but uh, whatever folks feel comfortable with. But uh, I'll entertain a, an amendment. Do you want to speak to the amendment? Uh, well, um, I'll please Tyler. either make a motion formally or no discussion back and forth. Does anyone wish to make a proposed amendment to the motion? Councillor Eastmere. In light of the discussion, I would move an amendment that we remove the title of the bill and show our support for a national strategy around this. Seconded, Councillor Perino. Any discussion on the amendment? Councillor Brown. Thank you, and I would say I only noticed like five minutes ago that the bill was attached because when I open it online, um, it's at the bottom and it doesn't open the second attachment, so I apologize to you, Council, and also uh, the submitter for not uh, seeing that. Thank you. Uh, Gremlins, Councillor Brown, I see them all the time. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, on the main motion. Uh, no. Your Worship, first you would vote on the amendment. Yes, on the, on the amendment, all those in favor of the amendment and any opposed, none, motion carries. Discussion on the motion as amended. Councillor Eastmere. Uh, I'm certainly in favor of us uh, showing support for this. This is uh, an issue, while it might not be in our 
jurisdiction per se. It's a, an issue that we're really struggling with in Nanaimo. The letter from the Nanaimo Brain Injury Society talks about the link between uh, overdoses from the to toxic drug crisis and uh, brain injuries, and that is that's something that we're really witnessing on the street and a huge lack of support for people who have come through that. Uh, so I think this is an important thing for us to weigh into and, and let our provincial and federal representatives know that we, we need more uh, supports for people. Councillor Prino. Thank you, Your Worship, and, and obviously I agree 100% with what Councillor Eastmere has just said. I just think the important thing to note with this is that we're not stepping into the role of the federal government. This is about advocacy, and this is such an important topic, and I'm, I'm pleased to see that we're doing this, and I'm really impressed with the Nanaimo Brain Injury Society that they have started this. This is an important piece of work, and uh, actually I did like the bill C-277. It was, it was well written. I'm, I'm, I'm pleased to see this go ahead. Thank you. Uh, keeping in mind that we are voting on two motions now that remove reference to the Bill C-277, we're simply asking for supporting a national strategy on brain injuries yep. act. Uh, Councillor Armstrong, did you wish to say something? Yeah, now that the uh, reference to the bill has been removed, I'm comfortable uh, supporting it because now we are doing advocacy, not pushing a bill forward. Thank you. I, th thank you very much, uh, please. Uh, you know the rules here. Uh, l let me just say this, and, and this might come as a bit of a surprise to, f to folks. Uh, if there were a motion in front of us tonight to support uh, funding for transgender surgery for 18-year-old students that was the subject of a private member's bill and was brought to discussion at the table, we might all have a very different reaction. Um, well, I appreciate that, Councillor Eastmeer. You might not, but some people might. I'm just saying I'm pointing to a controversial topic. And my point in doing that is this. Um, I'm going, if I may, I'm going to support this tonight, but I, I want to make Council aware, I hope that it doesn't become a habit in this sense only. Uh, we will spend a great deal of time debating issues that are not in our line of fire, if you will, you can use whatever cliche you want that aren't our knitting, etc. And I think there is always a risk at that because others in the community may well say, well, council should be supporting this and we'll start to receive more and more letters. In this particular case, I'm well familiar with the uh, work of the Brain Injury Society. Uh, their very uh, able executive director is here. I never speak in a public place around the men uh, around the street disorder we have in our community without talking about the mental health, addictions, trauma, and brain injury crisis, and indeed a significant portion of the people in our streets who are homeless and suffering from addiction and mental health issues uh, now have significant brain injury. So I'm going to support it because I believe it's important to send a message, but I do want to put council on notice. There will be come times uh, when we may have to step back and recognize if we don't stick to our knitting, we will spend a great deal of our evening talking about things that we have no control over, no responsibility to fund, and will not be able to move forward uh, the proper business of the city of Nanaimo. So having gotten my little piece out, all those in favor? Any opposed? None, motion carries. Uh, the next is the Surf Rider Foundation Canada request for letter of support reclean coast clean waters initiative. Councillor Armstrong. Yes, I'd like to make a motion that uh, you supply a letter of support for them as requested. Thank you very much. Any discussion on this one? Seeing none, all those in favor? Any opposed? None. Motion carries. And Councillor Gesselbrock, please. Pickleball. Uh, thank you. Um, I, I'd like to, to move a motion um, that the uh, pickleball courts at Beaufort uh, be, be closed Easter uh, Sunday and Monday. Um, and this is, uh, um, that's a motion, yeah. Second. Uh, Councillor Armstrong, speak, please. To speak to it. This is from correspondence from uh, neighbors in that area. Uh, you know, pickleball has been highly successful and tons of people playing it, which is awesome. Um, and uh, 
for this particular area was unanticipated that it would be this highly used and it's resulted in uh, very uh, loud noises at all hours of the time. It's been very difficult for the neighborhood and as council is figuring out uh, strategies to uh, move courts in other areas to, to meet the demand of pickleball, um, we have to find a balance and compromise and this is one where we can provide the neighborhood a bit of relief uh, over a holiday that everybody is to enjoy. Thank you. Thank you very much. Councillor Armstrong? Okay, Counts Anyone else wish to speak to the motion? Councillor Brown. Interesting evening, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, I gotta say I'm kind of uncomfortable with this. Um, just, uh, we have process and and literally no policy around these type of things so it just seems like it would be ripe for picking and choosing um, and and I actually uh, really understand the uh, well no I don't I don't think I can understand it until you live lived like some of these individuals do but um, I think if we're going to I will vote in favor but I think if we're going to I think this has happened twice in a matter of months. And if we are going to uh, entertain things like that, where there's a type of, a type of public use that's associated with recreation, that we need to have a policy in place that defines the parameters in which a decision like th this gets made. So I, I will vote. You know, no one's gonna be quite unpopular. Uh, for some, uh, that neighborhood relief and uh, for a couple individuals in particular, I think is important um, until that longer term fixes. But I think we're at the point, uh, and I'm not going to make a motion of it, but uh, I'll leave it in the hands of your worship to uh, exercise your mayor powers if you, if you choose with staff that we have something that comes forward and a policy in place for how we uh, deal with requests like this and, and the type of parameters around that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Armstrong, and then Councillor Prino. Yeah, I, I'll be speaking in favor of the two. I think it's a good compromise. I, I don't think there's anybody, and I'm speaking to the pickleball people that I know we'll get the emails from that would want to live by that. Starting at 6.30 in the morning, going right up till eight or nine, constant, constant. These people never can enjoy the quiet of their own properties. There's issues around health and illness, so uh, I was on the council that put those there, and that's a decision I regret because I think it had a huge consequences for the neighborhood. And I hope that we can fix it sooner than later. And that's one of the reasons why we did move to build eight more pickleball courts. So I think it does strike a balance. There's going to be people upset both sides, but it's a balance. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Prino. Thank you. Thank you, Your Worship. I, I do agree with Councillor Brown about process and policies. It's important, but there, putting a pickleball court in that particular area was uh, appeared to be a good decision at the time until you're the neighbors that are living right beside it. And it's very difficult. The noise is unrelenting. And I, I agree to be able to give them Easter Sunday off and the Monday following. That's a good compromise. It's, it's not the best policy. It's not the best way forward. But as long as we know we are working on solutions to change it, that's the most important piece. And it's, it's tough for the pickleball people. It's tough for the people who live in that area. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm uh, sympathetic to what Councilor Brown has had to say tonight, and uh, if the city wasn't working on uh, getting courts in other places that, uh, how shall I say, are more suitable to people enjoying uh, or having the quiet enjoyment of their own homes, um, I, uh, I uh, perhaps might vote differently. But in the circumstances, giving the neighborhood a break on a couple days on Easter weekend, I don't think is unreasonable because it's probably fair to say they're going to face with the uh, significant improvement in uh, climate in our community in terms of warm weather, they're going to see a long and steady interruption of their quiet enjoyment for many months through this spring and summer uh, and into the fall again and until we can provide alternate places for pickleball to be played. It is a very popular sport and I acknowledge that and I'm glad to see so many people out getting their athletic activity but every once in a while you need to consider that uh, this was, these were originally tennis courts, not nearly used in the same way, uh, and it was a decision of the city to allow uh, pickleball to be played there, and I don't think anyone ever anticipated the level of interest. So having said that, councillors, oh, I've inspired people. Councillors Hemmons and Eastmere. 
Thank you, Your Worship. Um, speaking in opposition to this, I, I agree with Councillor Brown. I think this is, a, this is a tricky precedent to set. We have done this before, and we did that in December, and I think those courts were utilized a lot less then. Um, this council could move to remove those courts. That might be the appropriate action rather than entertaining um, letters to close them for weekends. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm in opposition. Thank you. Thank you very much. Councillor Ishmir. Uh, thank you. I think this is a hard one given that um, we are kind of making a decision on the fly here following up on a precedent we already set over Christmas uh, to, to give people a little bit of peace and quiet over those few stat holidays that they get to be home with their families. Uh, and uh, for me, I, I'm in support of this because it's just two days and it's not like there aren't other pickleball courts that people can go play at. Uh, Bebin courts are also free and available just up the road. There's also courts at Departure Bay. So uh, given that, I, I think uh, this is a, a reasonable thing, but we do need to and will be having the conversation that Councillor Hemmons talked about. Uh, and this council also did support adding new courts to Bebin to facilitate that. Thank you, Councillor Gesselbrock. No, I'm, 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 nope. I'm Good. just shaking my head. <laughs> Let's get this ball off the court. All those in favor of the motion and those opposed, Councillors Hemmons. <laughs> well, Councillor Hemmons, we win, you lose. <laughs> motion carries. Uh, question period, Ms. Gurry. Thank you very much. Uh, the first is Valentina Cardinale changes to public hearings. Ms. Cardinale. Uh, hello everyone, um, thanks for having me here. Uh, I'm, I just watched something on March 11th uh, regarding the fact that there's provincial things that are gonna change the fact that public hearings could just not happen anymore and then there are more restrictions to delegations and I don't understand it and I'm worried that it will impact the ability for people, the public engagement of people. I would like to really commend you in having people here today who m may not do, do, see do you have a Do you have a question? To I, yes, I'm getting to it. Um, that may not see eye, this is about public engagement, that may not see eye to eye with you. And this should have been a delegation, but I couldn't make it a delegation because I didn't, I still don't understand what's going on. So my question is, what's even happening? I don't get it. Um, did you today make it so that these public hearings, all these provincial changes about the way that council publicly en engages with us is on a wait and see? Is that what happened today? Okay, I don't understand. I don't understand why you didn't vote on March 11th for wait and see because that's how I would have expected you to have voted and that's not what happened on the 11th. In fact, you, you put through these changes and it seems odd to me that changes for public engagement didn't have any public uh, Ms. Cardinelli, is, if, if you've asked your question, we'd like a chance to answer it. This okay. is not a, you're not Why? a delegation. <laughs> Thank you. Why didn't you choose to do the wait and see option, every one of you? Uh, Ms. Ms. Cardinelli, you I did? can tell you if you'd um, been here earlier this evening, you'd know that council has referred this section uh, back to the Governance and Priorities Committee meeting for further discussion. My suggestion to you is, if you don't understand this, and you've expressed that concern about various other matters that have come before this council, uh, go online, read the reports that council gets. They are public documents. They are readily available. It will assist you. Uh, you may wish to read the provincial legislation, which re is referred to in those reports. That I may did. assist you as well. And if you have concerns about the provincial legislation, you should speak to your local MLA. That's a good idea. I will send a letter to the local MLA. But so that I'm clear, that is what happened. You did postpone these decisions until later. 
Is that what happened tonight? M Mr. Lindsay, please. Your, your Worship, just... I that think, is my question. Yeah, maybe just to step back. So I think there's, there's two things that are being talked about here, just to clarify. So first of all, it's the provincial government, which oh. has made a number of announcements, a number of recent announcements around housing, one of which is prohibiting local governments from holding public hearings where an application is related to housing. So any application that's coming in for rezoning, for housing, or more than 50% of the proposal is housing, local governments are prohibited from holding public hearings. The discussion that council was having at the GPC, and as now, as the mayor's mentioned, is referring back to the GPC, is a discussion about what do we wanna do with respect to delegations related to those applications, and whether those delegations um, will, will come forward, continue to come forward to council as they do, um, or do we make changes? Or as I think what you're saying is, do we wait and see how the provincial legislation unfolds and how case law around it is formed? But at this point, we're going back to GPC to continue that discussion. Okay. Um, are you interested in uh, in how I feel about uh, Ms. public Gar Ms. Cardinelli, hearings. please. With respect, this is question period. You ask a question, you get an answer. Council may have some questions back for you. I see we have councillors Brown and Gesselbrock and Armstrong who wish to respond. Uh, no, no real question. Just uh, some further further points. So, with respect to delegations uh, or, or changes into the general procedure, which you referenced there, really it's just a tightening up and adding clarity, more administrative. With respect to some of those changes around the bills that the uh, His Worship and and uh, CAO Lindsay referenced. Um, it's not something we can really ask the public on because it's just prescribed. You have to do this. Um, and so there's some reference there about wait and see, and that's really what does a judge rule when they get challenged by some regard. Um, but that doesn't necessarily change the directives included in uh, Bill 44 that says you cannot have a public hearing, nor can you put in things that um, essentially mimic that to slow down the process and get a public input so it is a very clear directive like any change there can be challenges that get refined through the courts but as it stands now it, it may look like council has some debate or things like that and is having some agency just to be clear we do not councillor gesselbrock uh thanks for your worship through you uh just to it, it, it's worth looking at the the discussion at the governance and priorities committee but basically council had whole series of different decision points on our procedural bylaw. Um, one, to get an alignment with the things that we no longer can have public hearings on, that's been prescribed by the province. But we also had decisions on how many delegations were allowed to come up at, at a time on, a, on, a, on an item um, and how long they can speak. And in fact, during that debate, you'll see all of council voted to keep it as is. We didn't want to limit the ability to come speak to council or the time or, or, or the number of times to come up. And so I think you'll be rest assured that within what we're allowed to do now with the new provincial re re uh, regulations, council is maintaining you know, an open, accessible uh, process you know, where we can. So uh, yeah, please check it out. And you know, also reach out if you want to walk through sort of the the details. But there is multiple parts of it that decisions need to be made on. Yeah, I just I just wanted to hear. I didn't want to be accused of sitting on my duff. Um, no, not at all. And Councillor Armstrong and Eastmere wish to respond as well. I just, for me, I'm I'm opposed to that legislation because I think it's important that the public does have a right to say. Because I think every time we turn around, it sees. So I think it's really. <laughs> I think it's really important that you notify your MLA how you feel, as well as the Minister of, of Housing, Minister Cavalon, that uh, I will. I will it's, it's really hurting the people's ability to speak on issues that impact them. Thank you. Counts. Thank you for answering me, my question. Councillor Eastmere. Uh, thank you, and uh, through you, I, I just wanted to thank you for taking the time to come and ask a question, and also, um, you know, with these changes, I feel like a lot of us around the council table feel like we had also been consulted, like local governments feel to us it, it was really a top-down approach and we did try to provide some feedback to the provincial government, which was not accepted and it wasn't a great feeling. Um, mm -hmm. And now we're dealing with the ramifications and it's not super clear to us. Uh, so I, I identify with feeling like you're not being consulted with um, and to Councillor Gesselbrecht's point about us not changing some of the engagement rules, like limiting the five minutes, all of that, like I think there was strong support for retaining the engagement that we're allowed to have. 
Um, and I, I welcome you to reach out to us as counselors, either by email or, you know, we're on Facebook, you can send us a DM, I'd be happy to sit down in the council meeting room and, and go over this stuff, because I know we all have different ways of learning and taking in information and reading the provincial legislation on the on the website is really overwhelming and so and I, try, I tried totally and I've tried to and that and I have the luxury of being able to talk to staff who who are great at work walking us through all of this and I'm more than happy to do that with any member of the public anytime I'm available for meetings and so yeah please come to City Hall it's your meeting room too and we can we can meet up and, and just work through this together because I think yeah the public engagement piece and people understanding is is cr critical so thanks for taking the time no problem thank you uh, the next is Jim Smith and that would relate to the delegation tonight mr. Hula's delegation mr. Smith uh, thank you mayor and council for taking my question I need to preface it before I ask it uh, during mayor Krogh's reply to mr. Hula's presentation Mr. Krogh stated that any adherence to unelected global organization agendas were purely voluntary and that there was no direct communication taking place between them. I would suggest that if this council and any previous councils are in fact actively pursuing their agendas, then the end result is still the same you are still following their agenda and it is the same as if you were directly communicating with them. Keep in mind that the citizens of Nanaimo have never had an opportunity to vote for these organizations, nor do we have an opportunity to hold them to account. <clears throat> and your question, sir? Okay, my, my question at this point is, would this council be willing to go on the public record and state very clearly that no additional costs were incurred by the recently completed fire hall, nor will any additional cost be incurred by the Nanaimo Operations Center as a direct result of being in pursuit of these agendas? I'll ask. Thank you. Councilor Armstrong. The fire hall did go over budget. And yeah, we, we had a, we had, from the initial, my, my, my recall is that we had to get more money, but I could be wrong. Ms. But that that's you? not my question. Yes, you said it did. No, you asked me if it went over budget. My question is did it incur costs as a result of pursuing the globalist green agenda, such as the sustainable development goals under the United Nations? And I previously heard Mr. Man Manning yeah. defending those no, uh, I, very goals. I, I so think, that's my question. Yeah, Will I, you I, go on the record I, and say I, that I, we're I, not paying I, for I, extra I, cost I, associated I, yeah, yeah, with yeah, this? No, no, no. I, look, I, I, I have your point, and I'll, try and I'll try and answer your question. If there are aspects of the construction of that building that were, were designed to reduce energy consumption, which meet provincial standards around construction, modern construction, uh, then you could arguably say, I suppose, that it might further the goals of people around the world and environmental organizations that, that wish to see a reduction of carbon footprint. So you could say that in one sense, but to suggest for a moment that some engineer, some contractor, some designer, some architect sat down and went through um, the rather, with great respect, innocuous letter that uh, I signed after the unanimous, unanimous vote of council and said, oh, we've got to do this, this, and this for this building. No, Mr. Smith, uh, I can safely answer that is the case. It didn't happen that way. And I will look you right in the eye and say, I don't believe a word you just told me. And, and sir, you're perfectly entitled to have that opinion, just as I don't share yours. It's the wonderful thing about a democracy. Now, Mr. S Mr. S Mr. Smith, you might want to save time. You uh, have a second question here about agenda item 10-2. I thought you might want to answer that. Councillor Brown, sorry. Yes. Thank you, Worship. I, I don't like to let a good theory stand in the way of facts. Council actually voted last term. They have a green buildings policy that seeks lead accreditation, which would, I think, be somewhat in line with the agenda you referenced. 
uh, due to the expense of going through that process. Uh, council at the time, and, and I say this because I may have been the lone vote, so it maybe sticks out in my mind uh, against council direction, uh, was that they would not seek that. So not in line with, I think, the, the agenda that you, you may think that council is following. So I just, I point that out as a piece of evidence that suggests that uh, there's some digging that you could do to maybe use facts to develop a theory rather than uh, taking a theory and looking for oh, facts. Okay, so having heard your response, you should have absolutely no problem with stating on the public record that you have not incurred any cost directly um, as a result of pursuing these agendas of the unelected global organizations. Uh, I just, I just well, well, you should have no problem stating that on the public record, if that's true. I, I just did. I, I think it's fair to say, Mr. Smith, uh, and, and uh, please, the nature of your question invites this response. Uh, I, uh, I'm, I'm not familiar with all of the goals of the World Economic Forum. I don't follow it. I don't read their material. Um, and so for any politician here to suggest we have or we haven't complied with their goals is a question, frankly, that no one can really answer. And I appreciate that there is a, a rhetorical aspect to your question and you're smiling and I think you get my point. Uh, so thanks for asking the question, but you're not going to get any answer that will satisfy you because this council cannot give you that answer. There's nothing it's asking rhetorical you, about why that you question. Ask me, why don't you ask me if I can state categorically that the building contractor involved in constructing the fire hall complied absolutely with every regulation under the building code. I assume and hope he did, sir, but I can't tell you that he did. So the question you're asking to me is pretty much akin to the same thing. You're asking for a commitment that is impossible to give an, impo an impossible answer. Ask me what two plus two is, I'll tell you it's four. Uh, ask me what day it is, I'll tell you what day it is. But that question, sir, with great respect, is rhetorical, and the re rhetoric is over for now. The next question goes to Mr. Annesley, agenda item 10, one Hold and on. two. Hold on, I have the next question. And, and I take my hat off to the master of obfuscation. Thank you. Uh, my next question. Um, it is my understanding that this, the city of Penticton sets aside a period uh, on a very regular basis. I'm not sure if it's monthly or every six weeks, whereby the council makes themselves available to the public uh, for a general uh, stand-up state whatever it is you want to say to the council, ask any questions you want. When I look at section 10, uh, part two of this agenda, it appears that the council is doing everything they can to stifle democracy in yeah. Nanaimo, not to enhance it. My question is, would you be willing to entertain doing something similar to what the city of Penticton is doing? Councilor Perino. Uh, Sorry. Just let me get to you. Thank you, Mr. Smith. I'm, I'm very familiar with the Okanagan. I was on council in Summerland and, and watched uh, what was going on in Penticton, and, and we did very similar things in Summerland. We used to have at least, oh, we'd have these coffee meetings where people could come and ask council any questions. But you know, I found, to be honest with you, that if I had one person show up, I was thrilled because people just weren't coming out. And particularly as we began using email, then I found People were emailing me questions all the time, and so that was just as easy to take the time to answer. But as you heard Councillor Eastmer say earlier, any one of us will, will answer questions, we'll meet with you, talk with you on the phone. I do it all the time, <laughs> meeting with people and talking with them about issues. So don't ever feel that we're pushing you aside. I just think the technology is better today as far as responding to people. But Because I used to sit in, in coffee places waiting for people to come, and they, they just wouldn't. They wouldn't come, so I, I don't want you to feel like we're we wouldn't. We would if if that's what works. We'll we'll be there gladly, gladly. So I'll buy the coffee. So you no no. Um, you know, it's it's not a problem. It's just that they didn't come, so that's why we changed. I think you would find that, given the current circumstances here in the city and globally in general, people are going to show up. Well, and I might you take about 50, so, 50 so my emails a day still I is, free anytime. The question still is, are you willing to entertain such a protocol? 
Uh, Mr. Smith, I think I can safely tell you that Council's always prepared, prepared to entertain any reasonable suggestion. This may well be one of them, just as we have a town hall meeting around our budget, which you really would think would attract a lot of people, but we couldn't even get enough folks out, uh, including via Zoom, to fill the hour allotted this last time. Oh, as, and as I recall, I think we had trouble the year before, and that was just an hour. I appreciate the suggestion, but let me, uh, let me just respond this and, and say, with some experiences I've said before in this council, having spent a few years in Victoria, and having attended a number of political town halls over the years. If you happen to call your town hall when there's a hot topic on the agenda, you will actually get participation. Otherwise, generally speaking, when you call a town hall, what you get out are your own supporters who want to ask you a bunch of softball questions and then everybody goes home and the public interest, if you will, generally speaking, doesn't get advanced. Now, that may be a cynical view, uh, and I don't want it to color what council may decide to do with your suggestion, but I'm just telling you based on my experience, if you don't hit it right, you can have those kind of gatherings, as Councillor Perino, who is a former mayor of uh, Summerland, will tell you. Um, it, doesn't, uh, it doesn't always work. It, it's a grand idea, and everyone talks about it, but rarely do you find people willing to participate, and if you do, then that's a good thing, because they should. We owe a great deal more to our democracy than simply showing up to vote, and I might remind you, only one out of four voters in the last civic election in this community chose to get off their duffers and come out and vote, but that's a story for another day. Thank you. The next item is Mr. Annesley. It's agenda item 1012, Mr. Annesley. Um, I just want a couple of questions of clarification. First, with the 10B1, um, I just, I'm having trouble understanding uh, council require 100 meter notification distance for amendments to the official community plan. If that's, I just don't really yeah, understand. No, it's, it's, a, it's a basically a technical question, but not that technical, and Mr. Lindsay will answer it. So on council, uh, a number of months ago, directed staff to review our procedures notification bylaw. So today, if there's a development applications, uh, there's many ways that that information shared with the neighborhood. So there's a sign that's put up on the property. Okay. There's ads in the newspaper and there is notice that's given to neighboring property owners. For many years, the distance has been 10 meters from the property. So basically that is adjacent properties. Yeah. Council's decided they want to uh, consider increasing that amount and directed staff to bring forward a bylaw to increase it from 10 meters to 100 meters, essentially notifying substantially more of the neighborhood about a development proposal. Okay, all right, just, just clarification. Um, on, um, for the uh, 10B2, um, so at a November 2023 City Council meeting, uh, Mr. Stanley Bartlett had a delegation and spoke about the NOC bylaw, which I believe was 7362, but I, I'm not 100% on that. Uh, since that was after the third reading, would that delegation be allowed under these new rules? Yeah. Sorry, it's, it's, it's Sorry. so uh, talk, talk Mr. Sandy Barlett, which you guys are aware of, who you're aware of, uh, in November after the first uh, right. uh, uh, AAP, he had a delegation, but it was after the third reading of the bylaw, which again, I think is 7362, but I, I could Count, be wrong. Would his, today, if these, if these were adopted, would that delegation be allowed today? Councilor Brown. Mike's a bit slow tonight, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, no worries. Um, so under the Local Government Act and Community Charter, there's like categorically different bylaws. So this is, this is uh, public hearings are, are held after land use bylaws. Yeah. Uh, things like financial, uh, you know, the adoption of financial plans, uh, AAPs, other things that are also dealt with through bylaws, they are categorically different. So there is no public hearing typically after third reading. Um, the Public hearing language is prescribed in the Local Government Act under, uh, you want to say Part 14, I might be wrong there, um, um, but really does speak to land use bylaws requiring a public hearing, and that's the nature of these. Uh, okay, it's just confusing because of the third reading part. That sounds to me like his delegation would not be allowed because it was a, it was a post third reading to that bylaw. So I'm reading. It, so this is just about. Uh, Mr. Annesley, Ms. Gurry has something further to add here. Um, yes, thank you. It's com it's just, if I may interrupt, these changes uh, prescribed by provincial legislation, which is, and I'll come back to my point earlier about what 
cities can and can't do. We are creatures of the provincial legislature. If they prescribe how we uh, handle bylaws, what we can and can't do, we have to comply with that. We're an inferior order of government. We're not recognized under the Constitution. Not that I want to belittle the work that we do. And having said that, the changes that have been come through bills 44, 46, and 47 are presenting some challenges for municipalities as we figure out what it means. Uh, none of these changes have been tested in courts, as uh, courts often do over time, test legislation. Uh, so we're in a, a bit of a zone here. Yep. Ms. Gurry, sorry, please. Um, no, that's okay, thank you, Worship. Through you to the delegation, I was just rereading exactly what the wording was, which is going back to a GPC to be discussed again. But no, um, it would not have affected Mr. Bartlett's ability to come and speak to the um, borrowing bylaw, which he did come and speak to. This is only for um, matters under Section 464 of the Local Government Act, which is developments, um, those that would be public hearing, rezonings, et cetera, those matters. So, so Mr. Okay. Bartlett would have been able to speak. It's just those that are prohibited um, from going to public hearing now and or that have been to public hearing pursuant to the new provincial legislation okay so that's okay that's good that's a good point of clarification so that that delegation would still be allowed under the, okay that's good i think that allays a lot of fears from people thank you thank you Thanks, next is it's i'm sorry it's jessica and i it looks like timlins or tindens or something i'm not sure and it just says delegation i'm sorry but it has to relate to an agenda item so which item are we talking about Jessica. Okay, so I just had Sorry, a question I, I about, um, I just have some I, I know, questions name. about his, um, your, Mr. Who? Yeah, 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 right, your name, please. Oh, Jessica Timmons. Timmons, thank Okay, you. so um, with his delegation, um, are, do we consider ourselves a smart city? Like, is Nanaimo considered a smart city? That's a very interesting question. Do we have technology available to us? I suppose we do, but being in a smart city, Ms. Gurry, do you wish to comment? Um, I can't fully answer that. Um, Mr. Ng, our IT director, probably could. Um, I know we um, look um, at different components of smart cities, um, participate in conferences to do with smart cities, um, but um, I'm not sure if we consider ourselves currently a smart city. I don't think we have the... Um, the technology right now to be actually considered. Okay, so are we gonna move forward with the technology? So my understanding of things that I've looked on the website as well as I have um, screenshotted a, when you have a job interview and it states you're a smart city. So it's like you're bragging, but not to the citizens. So I feel like you're not being transparent in what you're doing. Um, the first thing that if you want to pick up your phones and Google, is a smart city WEF driven, is what I just Googled in while I sat in the audience here. And the first thing that comes up is the World Economic Forum, which is the first thing that when you Google it comes up. Okay, so all these things, you guys might not be aware that these programs, things you're signing on to, are affiliated with the WEF right, the green initiatives, all these, all these things. So I have another question, how are we gonna track, so in our official community plan, or OCP, um, we're supposed to be tracking our emissions, so by 2030 we need to be 50% less than the 2010 emissions, right, that's our goal. Not even sure if you're citizens, so these are the types of things that the citizens are concerned that you're signing up, but you're not telling us we're the ones that have to drive these, as well as you guys and your city fleets and et cetera. But, so how are we tracking that? Is that through the cameras? Just knows an SUV or a truck's coming in a car? Is that what's tracking the admissions? Is that, and you're sharing this information, which is data, which is our personal city data, right? With other, because you're, we have these goals, right? Do you understand where we're coming from? Type, I'm trying to explain it a little bit better. Um, uh, th th well, let somebody answer So question. 15 minute cities as well, we have seven containment, uh, right? Um, 
so if you put in 15 minute cities, that's as well WEF stuff, and that's pretty much what your containment boundaries are. And I believe the provincial government gave you money as well for a consultation survey for the Metro Drive to become our first 15 minute zone. These all are intertwined. So uh, I would really I, appreciate I, if you guys I, could I think think you've into asked it. enough questions. Uh, all right, I'm sorry. With respect, sorry, you're, it, uh, it's rather difficult to respond to what amounts to more I'm of a monologue than questions. So uh, if we may, uh, Councillors Brown and Gesselbrock in order. Uh, thank you, Worship. I, I will answer the question, but I would encourage you to search filter bubble. Uh, so filter bubble is an algorithmic, algorithmic bias that occurs uh, in search engines that skew your results. So when I, I tend to look up a lot of different urban planning items. When I Google smart city, there's no WEF reference. It's based on your past search experiences um, and your past search uh, inquiries. So I say that because there is tools out there. I would uh, mm -hmm. DuckDuckGo, which actively works to break that bias so you get a broader spectrum of information presented to you. No search algorithm is gonna be perfect but it does aim to reduce bias in search. Um, with respect to your question, I think the simple answer is uh, no, we don't currently have enough, uh, uh, enough connected technology to, to, deem, to be deemed a smart city. Um, you can look at some examples from around the world, some, at, like some in particular in Brazil, where there's been a, a lot of collaboration with things like IBM, and they've put a lot of connected devices or IoT devices uh, throughout the city. Um, we have not done that locally to any sort of degree, so. And so are we gonna be moving, that's what I think a lot of people feel that you're moving towards a smart city, the internet of things, the cameras coming up, all this types of digital, right? Pretty much a smart city is a digital. City, yeah, and, and right? I think full transparency, there's been experimentation with that. Yeah. Um, uh, we do collect data on certain things that Mr. Sims referenced. Um, that is really just for how to charge for services on an equitable basis and uh, asset renewal. But uh, there it has been uh, experimentation with different types of technologies. Uh, no, nothing has been put in place, nor has anything been funded to date widespread. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councillor Gesselbrock. Uh, thanks, uh, Mayor, uh, through you. Yeah, just uh, your question about uh, emissions and how we track like how much carbon dioxide we produce as a community um, there's the, the province was tracking it for, for quite a while and they work with uh, the cities as well but basically there's just different ways that they measure by looking at like the number of buildings that you have in your community looking at how many uh, natural gas connections there are looking at how many vehicles are registered and then there's a ways to sort of extrapolate this is how much a city with all these different things in would be producing in terms of carbon dioxide and so um, you know, that, that's something that our city has committed to is reducing our carbon emissions and that's something that's sort of been agreed upon um, at an international level and at a local level that we need to reduce our emissions because if there's too much carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, it creates heating and it changes weather patterns and creates droughts and floods. And, and, and I know some folks do, um, are still trying to debate that, but that's, what widely accepted is, and we have committed to, to, to reducing that. So I, uh, uh, so in terms of that, that's how that data is is being collected, and then we work from that to be like, okay, you know, how can we reduce uh, emissions to meet those particular goals? All right, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, the next is Joe Feigel, I believe, and it's about the delegation. Wondering uh, how these pledges to the covenant affect the Nanaimo Operations Center, and have you guys considered building an operations center without pledges to an external source? Sorry, without pledges? Yeah, your pledges that you signed on to the Global Covenant of Mayors. Do you know what they are? Do you know what those pledges are? Without looking at your paper and reading them off the paper? Do any of you guys know? I, I'm I'm sorry. I'm I'm really trying hard to understand um, how uh, the uh, 
letter approved by so you signed on to a bunch of pledges there on behalf of the city of sir sir am i you ask a question i'm trying to give you an answer okay how a um pledge a pledge not a contractual pledge i might add with within our regulatory mandate and fiscal capacity to develop adopt use use and regularly report on the following a community scale ghg emission inventory following the recommended guidance an assessment of climate risks and vulnerabilities ambitious measurable and time bound targets to reduce slash avoid ghg emissions ambitious climate change adaptation vision and goals based on quali quantified scientific evidence when possible to increase local resilience to climate change an ambitious and just goal to improve access to secure, sustainable, and affordable energy, and a formally adopted plan slash plans addressing climate change mitigation, low emission development, climate resilience and adaptation, and access to sustainable energy. Um, and your question is, how did that impact the proposal for Co now? Correct, because correct. Uh, that infrastructure has to comply with this covenant. Is that not correct, or uh, am I wrong? Well, uh, actually, and, and I guess this is my point, and perhaps I haven't made it clear enough. <clears throat> uh, this is a letter of commitment that is, to me, like rather signing on for the environmental wish list or, or the Christmas list when I was a child. These are we hope that we will reduce our greenhouse gas emissions. We'd like to live in a sustainable community. We'd like to build in an efficient way that will reduce our carbon footprint. But it, in, you know, I'm going to say something to the people laughing in the back and making remarks. In a civilized world, we try and be respectful to one another and it seems to me that in many places, in too many places, we are moving towards that ugly part of history where the loudest voices are the only ones that get heard and try and stamp out reasonable conversation and dialogue. And I would really like to think, I would really like to think the citizens of this city would be as concerned about that as I am. I my agree with you, I'd like sir. to have dialogue. My point... I will show less disdain, sir, when people show less disdain for public gatherings governed by rules and a code of conduct and procedure which is in writing and available for you to read. Now, if I can come back to your point. Thank you. And your question, if I may. Those are the rec following the recommended guidance. Again, if you look, would. I really wish everyone had this letter in front of them and could read it tonight and understand it is a statement of values. You might recall that the great republic to the south of us once entered into a document that said that all men were created equal, that life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness was the goal. Meanwhile, they had millions of people classified as chattels who were called slaves. So with respect, I get the point, and I don't want to sound too high-handed, and if I sign like I'm getting disdainful of some of the conversation, let me just say I am happy to subscribe and will continue to subscribe to things that speak to the best goals of humanity and society, and that includes recognizing whether or not you believe that climate change is the result of being in a natural cycle or is caused or exacerbated by human behavior or some combination thereof, Wanting to live in a community where there isn't significant climate damage, where provinces don't have to face up to the prospect of trying to revive a grape industry that has been decimated by a cold winter, or a Fraser Valley farming community that's been devastated by flooding, if living up to the goals that might prevent some of that is happening is seen as somehow a conspiracy, or uh, what's the sign this gal's holding up tonight there, something about treason, whatever, uh, well, sir, Whatever. then fine. But you know what? Honestly, I am uh, <laughs> not going to give you the benefit of a longer answer. If you have a, a more specific and, with, if I may say, a question that's capable of being answered as opposed to what amounts to a rhetorical question, I'll be happy to answer it. Yeah, it's not really a rhetorical question. It was a pretty specific question. I asked if specifically you knew how much 
of that $163 million to build the Nanaimo Operations Center because to me, at least the way I understood it, is that you guys were building a new public works building, right? What would it cost to just build a public works building without those initiatives in mind? Just the, initi the initiatives of building a public works building for the citizens of Nanaimo. Now, um, I mean, I, I don't think the city council and the mayor can solve climate change. I also really love the environment. But, I mean, this pledge signs us onto something that's dictated on, onto Nanaimo. Let, ahead, let, let, let me step back a minute, and I've, I've obviously not been very clear tonight, and I apologize for that. Okay. As I keep telling everyone and trying to repeat this over and over again, you and I enter into a written contract tonight that I'm going to build you a, a gazebo in your backyard for a thousand bucks. If I don't build the gazebo for you for a thousand bucks, say I leave halfway through or whatever, you have the right to sue me in court, right? That's a pretty I, I, obvious question. I, I suppose. I, I agree to I, sell you my house at a certain price, and on completion, I refuse to complete the sale. You sue me in court, yep. correct? We have a mechanism for enforcement. What do you think the mechanism for enforcement of this pledge is? Do you think the world... Well, that goes to my next no, question. No, 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 please, 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 because that's the implication of everything that's been said tonight, yeah. that somehow the city is committed to things that can be enforced, and I'm just telling you, you don't have to be a Philadelphia lawyer to answer that question. Sure. This is not simply enforceable. But I'm going to give a couple other councillors a chance to respond. Sure. Uh, councillors Gesselbrock and Armstrong. Oh, I, I must have accidentally hit it. But you know, the pledge means absolutely nothing. Like, it, it really was, it means nothing. It's not enforceable. It doesn't have any impact on anything. And, like, I, I really, I, I, I guess, I, to be totally honest, I sometimes find that things are just being picked up on and created a big scene about uh, that are complete waste and conspiracy nonsense. And I sometimes actually get really worried that these are the things that people are picking up on as being important. And I think asking about the Nanaimo Operations Center cost overruns, that's legit. And, and why is it expensive? What things are you doing? But to tie it to some pledge that it floating but off that's, that's, that's what I'm doing. I'm talking about the cost overruns. I see. You no, know, you're, no, you're actually talking about the pledge. You said the pledge, and I, I just want to tell you very clearly yeah. it has zero impact. And that, like, is a very short answer. No. Okay, so can you just build a public works building that's a public works building without pledging to these initiatives on this covenant? I'm, I'm going to go to Mr. Lindsay. And then I have another, I have another question, well, but, too. But, sorry, yeah. you're still getting in your answers. Yeah. So your worship, I, I think Councillor Council Gesselbrecht answered most of what I wanted to say, but to the question of what is the influence on the cost of the project because of the signing of this letter uh, to, the May, to the Covenant of Mayors, and the answer is there's zero implications. But what I think is really important when you talk about um, the, the, the um, goals and objectives of that letter, which are to reduce carbon greenhouse gases, to monitor our use across the community, and to prepare for climate adaptation and change. Those are all things that the city was already doing and had been committed to for decades in previous policies and initiatives. So when you say, is there an impact on the cost of building facilities because of uh, climate change? Yes, before the, uh, the letter was ever signed, the city had a green building policy um, which directed us on how to build buildings. When we build new infrastructure, do we consider um, high periods of drought and high periods of rainfall in the winter, which is now more frequent? Yes. Do we modify our engineering systems to maintain pre-development flows so that creeks aren't overrun when we have more frequent storms? Absolutely, we do. So when we build infrastructure like NOC, we do take those things into account, not because we signed or because the mayor signed on behalf of council a letter, but because it's in and has been in council's policies and objectives for well over 20 years that we're doing all of those things. Councillor Armstrong, thank you, Mr. Zeman. Just to Councilor answer, Zeman. going to the, going back to the uh, operations center, it is coming back to GPC for further discussion because we are looking at, we're going to be looking at options as it's been suggested as maybe removing the trail, maybe doing that. So it is coming back, which was Mr. Lindsay, no, it was at our 
I guess about a month ago meeting where we said we would bring it back, is that correct? And then my second point, just when you talk about that declaration, if we really believed in it, there was four of us on this council that voted against bringing in the uh, natural gas stuff. So there's a prime example of how we're not beholden to it because myself, Prino and, and uh, Mayor Krogh and whatever, voted against bringing it in sooner than the province wanted. So that, that's an example of right there. I can tell you right now, as she said, that a pledge means nothing to me. I'm gonna vote how I believe is best for what I believe is best for the city and what I hear. And in that particular case, I didn't think banning natural gas was a good thing, so I voted against it. Thank you, and Cheryl. finally, Councillor Gesselbrock, one more response. I, I, I'm gonna risk uh, saying something that might incite a little bit of fear, but I, I really just wanna, I think it's really cool that people are showing up and listening to council and participating. I think this is what we need to be doing. Um, I think sometimes when we're at our computer and caught in these algorithms and typing in stuff to Google and reading all this stuff, you start getting separated from what's actually going on. And, and I think that as people come regularly to the council meetings, reach out to your counselors, talk to us on the phone, everybody's available by phone call, uh, email, um, to start really understanding like what goes into making these decisions. And, and I, what, I, what I guarantee will happen very quickly is that things about the World Economic Forum, um, these global elitists, is gonna quickly drop out of the picture of w how you're interpreting what's, what's going on. And, and, and my suggestion, because to, to everybody, is like coming up and asking about the Nanaimo Operations Center, cost overruns, AAP, local participation democracy, that's really cool. As soon as it gets tied to the stuff that's on the internet about the World Economic Forum, what happens like to, to the person personally that's bringing forward it like you lose legitimacy and like I really want people to be taken seriously for what they have to say but bringing this stuff up that is 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 separated in sort of the internet universe and not based in reality just people stop being taken seriously and and I really want to take you seriously yeah. and I want to take so everybody seriously but I really invite folks to come keep participating at the council meetings asking questions and also being open to, if somebody is asking me a question on the internet, somebody asked me anything and I gave them a long response about how I came across donut economics, why it's implemented, what it's related to, and the person wrote back immediately and said, well, I don't believe anything that you're saying, this is not what I read from so-and-so source that like, I, I met on the internet, it's like, I could spend hours explaining, and no matter what I say, even if I walk you through my day-to-day, -day, all my email chains, you're not gonna believe me. And how do you win against that? And I think that's what I'm scared about is that people, no matter how much you show them, wanna believe this thing that there's like this other force out there controlling them so that they can somehow feel, I don't know what it is, more, more in control or what, but I think by just showing up here and engaging with council and engaging in the dialogue, I think people are gonna feel empowered. Like we've got, we've spent very open listening to people's questions you can come to any council meeting democracy is happening right now and this is how it works and we need to defend what we have here and getting into yelling matches and showing up at council meetings and yelling over while we're trying to business meeting that's just eroding our ability to actually be open i, you I think, think we're do going you think, off no, subject hold on here. hold on just a second like do you think our staff feel comfortable when somebody's behind them yelling obscenities and mumbling under their breath that they want to like I didn't yell I know you're not, but yeah. sir, you've been a leader and I've seen you showing up, talking in front of people. It is condoning it, but people don't want to feel scared sitting up here because we come, the staff come to do their job. I come to do my job. I've got a family at home and we want to have an open democracy where people can run for election. So do I, and I don't want you to be scared. All right, excellent. And, and I'm not the so, leader. So please take some leadership in your role in the community because I see that you're having a voice and help out because what we need to do is build a stronger democracy and not have this like yelling match and people threatening because it doesn't work that way. We're all people, we can all talk to each other and we can share our ideas and work together. So I really appreciate that. Thanks for coming and that's what I have to say. I'm looking forward to working together. Okay. You have another question? Yes, my last question was, did this commitment with the covenant pledge us to borrow money from the FCM for the infrastructure to implement? Absolutely not. We, we borrow from the Municipal Finance Authority as best we can because the Municipal Finance Authority gets the city the best rate. That's what 
municipal governments across this province do in order to uh, reduce the cost to uh, to the ratepayers. So the covenant has nothing to do with the Federation of Canadian Municipalities Borrowing Fund. Ms. Mercer, can you help me out here, Director of Finance? Yep. It's on the website. To your worship, um, that's something I would have to look into. We, all of our borrowing goes through the um, MFABC, and okay. So we don't generally. Maybe, maybe I'll send you a link, and maybe you guys can explain it next time. Cool. All right. Thanks for your time. And th sorry th 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 thank you. And, and I'm going to make a suggestion. And it's not to you. It's to the audience generally who's come here tonight. Okay. I want to thank Councillor Gesselbrock for his eloquent words. I very much appreciate it, and in particular, his defense of staff. Um, there was concerns tonight raised about information that's readily available on the internet. You've done searches, and I often hear the term, I've done my research, and so on, and, and Councillor Brown uh, commented on this. Um, I don't do social media. Uh, the only time I've done social media is if uh, during a campaign I get somebody to answer questions raised by the public. I, uh, I don't search much stuff on the internet except maybe a fragment of poetry or the name of a person or something like that. I just strongly suggest that if you're really worried about data collection and you're really worried about conspiracies and organizations, Stay away from the damned electronic devices, please. Uh, it has been both a blessing and an incredible curse. And it's nice to get useful information maybe about your health and if you've got symptoms that require medical attention. But honestly, the amount of garbage that is out there, the propaganda and the information, it really, really disturbs me. I've managed to survive and prosper in this community without benefit of social media or spending my time in the screen. And if you're really worried about the damn screen, get rid of your cell phones. If you think the city's collecting data on you, we're not. But I will tell you this much, just so you all know, I shop at Save On because it's a union store and I'm a strong union supporter. I believe in decent wages. And I use my Save On card. And you know something? I sometimes worry, I sometimes worry that maybe Jimmy Patterson is collecting all that data and is associating it with me and he knows what brand of toilet paper I use, but it's a risk I'm willing to take. Motion for adjournment, please. Right. Thank you very much. Move, Councillor Armstrong. Seconded, Councillor Hemmons. All those in favor, thank you very much.